Hello everybody and welcome to this online lecture for alkanes. This is our first organic topic in module 4 and it looks at the reactivity of the CH bond but also the general features of the alkane homologous series. You're going to need the alkane notes to work along with this video. You'll be able to find those on canvas both blank and completed sets. You can fill them in before you watch the video or you can fill them in as we go along. It's entirely up to you. You may even want to watch this video twice to make sure you've secured all the understanding. At the end of this video, on the final end screen, there'll be lots of links to other videos and you can also click the eye at the top of the screen now to be taken to other videos relating to this early organic chemistry content. I'll leave you to the online lecture. Happy revising! Hi guys and welcome back. So, in this video I'm going to give you a full walkthrough of the alkane notes. You can access these via Canvas and this filled in version here can be done using the ones that are on screen or you can actually obviously use the filled in set that's there. So, when we're looking at different alkanes, our first thing to talk about is their variance in boiling points. So, I've got three different alkanes here for you. I've got ethane, I've got butane and I've got 2-methylpropane. Now, these two have got something in common, whereas this one is actually literally just completely different. I don't like doing ethane in skeletal, so I've shown it out in full, even though it says skeletal here, because, you know, break the rules. Um, and here, butane and 2-methylpropane I have done in skeletal, because they're nice and clear. Ethane in skeletal would effectively just be a slash, and so I really try and avoid that wherever possible. You want to make sure that it's nice and clear to the examiner. Now, the relationship between these two is that they are structural isomers, which means they've got the same molecular formula, but different structural formula. Ethane, totally different, C2H6. Now, remember that all organic substances fall into the category of the simple molecular lattice structure. And so what that means is when we melt or boil these, we aren't breaking any bonds at all. We're breaking into molecular bonds. So, for example, we could be breaking London forces, and in fact, for alkanes, those are the exact intermolecular bonds we consider. We can see the impact of these London forces in the boiling points here of the three alkanes. So, this very, very low boiling point here for the ethane, minus 89 degrees C, is because the London forces are incredibly weak. Here, for the butane, we can see minus 1, I mean, it's still pretty low, but it's stronger London forces than the ethane. The difference between these two, we're going to have to explain a little bit more, but you can see here there is an 11 degree difference where it's easier to break the London forces here into methylpropane. So let's understand these comparisons. So the difference in the boiling points, as we've already mentioned, is because of the London force difference. The weaker those London forces are, the lower the boiling point ends up. But we need to put some emphasis here on why those London forces are weaker. Ethane, for example, has got this very, very low boiling point over here because it's got fewer electrons. And then our main reason that we point out is because it's quite a short chain, we've got less surface area contact points between molecules. And actually, that's the same explanation, as you can see highlighted in the pink just here, as why we explain why 2-methylpropane has got a lower boiling point than butane. 2-methylpropane is an example of a branched alkane. And branched molecules typically have lower boiling points because they have fewer surface area contact points between molecules. Butane isn't branched, it's a straight chain, and as you can see here in the highlighted pink section, it points out that butane has a higher amount of surface area contact between its molecules, and that gives it stronger, or you can say more, London forces. The other thing we need to know about for the essentials of alkanes is their combustion. Now, for combustion of alkanes, it is very, very simple. It's just the alkane, or the fuel we can call it, add oxygen to give CO2 and H2O for complete combustion. You may be asked for state symbols for this, and you wouldn't be expected to memorize the states of any of the alkanes, with the exception of methane. They would expect you to know that that one is a gas. Now, whenever you're balancing a combustion equation, may I please give you a tip? Always choose a consistent method. Choose, meaning we're going to start with the carbons, then the hydrogens, and then the oxygens when we balance. It means it automatically balances itself if you do it in that order. Now, in a limited oxygen environment, we can have incomplete combustion take place, and instead of making CO2, we can make carbon monoxide, which is toxic. 
So the next thing we need to consider about alkanes is how the functional group reacts to form a different one. Now this is the first time we've really ever considered this, and it's really the big focus of organic chemistry. For organic chemistry, we don't actually react the entire molecule every single time. We just look at specific functional groups and we see how they change. And in fact, using clever resources, we can change one functional group and leave another completely intact. Only changing one small section of a molecule at a time is an essential feature of organic chemistry. For example, this is your first scenario where we're changing just one small section of a molecule and we're going to take a CH and turn it into a CX, where the X can be any of the halogens. We start off with any alkane, or to be honest, it could be that this CH bond is in something that isn't an alkane, but this comes in the alkane notes because the CH is such a quintessential feature of alkanes. And we react a CH bond with a halogen, which can be any of the group 7, in the presence of UV light. It's just got to be the correct formula, it's got to be the X2. And what happens is the CH is going to become a CX. That's exactly what changes on our molecule. We also produce some HX, and it must match all the way through here with the same X. So for example, if Cl2 is used up here, I make HCl and a CCl bond. That's absolutely crucial. With the equations that you can see here, we can actually see this small change of the molecule in action. The green highlighted section here shows you how the only part of the molecule that changed here was I changed a CH for a CCl. You could have picked any of these bonds, they're all CHs, I just so happen to have chosen this one here. Similarly, this ethane just gives us more options, it could have been any of these CH bonds, but I've chosen this one and you can see here it becomes a CBr. Notice how for every single one of these I want to change, I make an HBr and I use a Br2. So one bond, one of them, one new bond, one of these. That leads us to our multiple scenario. Sometimes in the exam question they expect you to write an equation where more than one bond changes in this reaction. We call this further substitution and we'll see it later down the line. For instance here, two of these CH bonds, two of the Cl2 therefore, to give me two of the CCl bond and two of the HCl. And so we use two to add two and we make two of these. But we only have one of our original alkane or other CH bond containing starting material. Don't forget that these filled in notes are available on Canvas. So what we just saw was our first example of a substitution reaction. And now to follow it up, we've got our first example of a reaction mechanism for organic chemistry. Organic chemistry very often has a behind the scenes image of what's going on, which we call a reaction mechanism. A reaction mechanism tells you more details about the overall that you see in the reaction equation. There is actually more taking place than meets the eye. For example, the reaction we just saw was a, a scenario which a CH bond swapped or substituted for a CX bond, and we call that a substitution reaction. Here, we can actually see that this reaction took place via a mechanism which didn't fully represent itself in the overall equation. In the exam, they will separately ask you to outline the mechanism, a radical substitution, for the reaction we've just seen. The mechanism of radical substitution has three stages and gives you six equations when all stages are finished. The three stages are called initiation, propagation, and termination. Stage one, initiation, has one equation to learn. Stage two, propagation, has two equations to learn. And stage three, termination, has, brace yourself, three equations to learn. So let's have a look at initiation to get us started. Let's have a closer look at this first stage of the radical substitution mechanism, which is called initiation. Initiation utilizes the UV light that I mentioned was an essential condition from the previous page. Now, in order to do this reaction, the UV light is necessary because it starts off initiation, causing for homolytic fission of the bond between the two halogens in the X2. So, for example, if I have Cl2, the UV light causes for homolytic fission to take place to create these two free radicals. Now, 
We know these are free radicals because they have a dot shown next to them, and the dot represents a single unpaired electron. Free radicals are incredibly reactive, and forming them in this kind of a stage is called homolytic fission. Moving swiftly into our second stage of the radical substitution mechanism, we see that the radical that we've just made, so the X radical that we created in initiation, now causes for the start of a chain reaction. And we call this next stage propagation. Propagation has two distinctive equations which show how the radical goes in and then comes back out again chemically unchanged. This means that the radical is a catalyst in these two equations and you have to be very careful with propagation as it can be quite complicated. Don't forget that these notes are available on Canvas because you will you'll need to take your time making sure that all your formulae are correct here. Now I'm using CH4 as my alkane in this just because it's simple and I don't want to overcomplicate this first example. But I could use any alkane here or anything really with a CH bond that's ready to undergo this substitution. You are allowed in the exam, and this is rare by the way, to actually use molecular formula for your material at this stage as well. So for example here, if I needed to react ethane, I would be allowed to write C2H6. I wouldn't be expected to draw it out in full. But again, if you want to draw it out, draw it out. So for propagation one, so our first stage of propagation, we see that whatever our starting alkane molecule is, reacts with our radical that we created from initiation, and it must be the same one. Notice how it is only one of them as well, even though two were made. What happens is the X radical causes for a bond to be broken between a carbon and a hydrogen, and the radical takes the hydrogen for itself. Now, the breaking of the bond causes for the carbon that was bonded to the hydrogen to be left as a free radical. So I now have an alkyl radical here shown in the products. So our general template here is start a molecule, add halogen radical, gives alkyl radical and hydrogen halide, making sure that the X's match. You can see here a closer look at this structure showing the radical dot actually on the carbon as well. Now for stage two, and by the way, this was voted by last year's students as the most difficult stage of radical substitution to remember correctly, we take the alkyl radical that we've just made and we react it with the original halogen that was actually shown to have reacted in initiation. Don't overthink it too much, just introduce it here at this stage. So my CH3 radical here is reacting with the X2 and it must be the one from the overall equation. And it does a very similar thing that happens last time. The radical pinches one of the X's from here causing for an intact molecule, which is now our target organic molecule. It's actually our haloalkane. And we reform the halogen radical that we, saw, that we saw getting used in the first stage of propagation. So this, the general template for this equation is alkyl radical with halogen to give haloalkane target product and halogen radical. I mentioned this at the start of this section as well, but as you can see here, the halogen radical goes in and comes back out, chemically unchanged. And so the halogen radical is catalyzing this process. And it's demonstrated here by these two equations of propagation. Make sure to read the notes very carefully and get down all of these finer details. The final stage of my radical substitution mechanism, which remember is all for showing how the CH bond got substituted to become a CX bond when we originally introduced this reaction in the notes, this final stage, termination, has three separate equations, with one of them taking a massive level of priority over the other two. So what happens in termination is we effectively shut down the process. In propagation, the whole thing could keep going round and round and round because the radical was constantly going back in and back in and back in. It was getting reformed and used and reformed and used and so on. Termination shuts the process down. What happens is we take any two radicals that have been used so far so we can mix and match, which is actually more desired, 
or we can take two of the same radical and we effectively pair up the unpaired electrons. So these two radicals will combine together to make a molecule. And we can see that's a consistent pattern all the way down here. Now this is called termination and option three here is the one that's most demanded by the exam questions. And the reason is because unlike the other two, it shows the formation of the target organic molecule that was represented by the overall equation on page three of your notes. It's also worth pointing out if you look at that overall equation for the substitution of the CH bond to a CX bond, that these two weren't shown as products at all. These are alternative products that could be made in termination, and they're actually one of the criticisms of how we can end up with a mixture of organic products at the end of the radical substitution process. Now what might also happen towards the end of the process is we can end up with further substitution, and you'll find that that comes up a lot in the exam questions. We'll get to that in a moment. But I really want to emphasize to you here that this final stage which follows the initiation and propagation stages that we've seen already in the radical substitution mechanism, this final stage of termination takes any two radicals and combines them together to make a molecule, which no longer has that radical dot representing a single unpaired electron. They may ask for a specific termination equation in the exam. For instance, instead of just asking for the equation that shows the formation of the target organic haloalkane molecule, they may specifically say, show a termination equation that forms a molecule with a particular molar mass. So you'll have to make sure that you read the exam question really carefully to look out for things like that. Now, like I said, one of the other problems with radical substitution is that further substitution can take place. We saw in propagation that any CH bond could be reacted with a halogen radical, and then after the second stage of propagation, it had then finally been substituted and changed into a CX bond. So propagation really did show that CH becoming a CX. But then it could have been any CH. And in fact, sometimes your product at the end of the second propagation equation still has some CHs left over. Well, they are fair game, and they could go back into propagation, and we could see that more CH bonds on the same molecule actually end up becoming CX bonds. And we call this further substitution. It's the general idea that methane could go in with the intention of becoming chloromethane, but can you see here how this has still got CH bonds? Well, that could go back in, and that could become CH2Cl2, dichloromethane. But then that's still got CH bond. Can you see where I'm going with this? The idea is that further substitution of other CH bonds could take place. And as a result, radical substitution is a little bit poor as a method of creating a single organic molecule product because you can end up with a mixture of organic molecules. And you need to make sure you understand that this is called further substitution. That's actually it for alkanes, so click the links on screen now to be taken to more examples of radical substitution and a second walkthrough. There's also videos about skeletal formula and general organic chemistry. Happy revising!